Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Allie, and I'm your host for this evening. And I'm so excited to be introducing Lori M. Lee and Taylor K. Mejia here to discuss Lori's new middle grade book, Pahwa and the Soul Stealer. But before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been a such delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your support really is what makes all of this possible. So I will be linking directly to books in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go find them. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we do ship. And once again, we are so, so grateful for your support. So while you are over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases and our online book clubs. And of course, follow us on any of the major your social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. We even have a TikTok. Um, we have a pretty good time on those social media platforms, so definitely go and check those out. So we are here for about an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. It's different than the chat, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. We would love to know where you're from or your favorite latest read. But when it comes time for questions, please do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Finally, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Lori M. Lee, the author of two YA series, Gates of Thread and Stone and Shaman Born, a contributor to several anthologies, including A Thousand Beginnings and Endings, The Color Outside the Lines, and of course, her newest book, Pahwa and the Soul Stealer, a Rick Rudin presents book about a young Hmong girl who learns she's a powerful shaman warrior, able to see spirits and hopefully rescue her little brother in a fantasy inspired by Southeast Asian mythology. In conversation tonight, I am so pleased to introduce Taylor K. Mejia, the author of YA fantasy novels, We Set the Dark on Fire, and We Unleash the Merciless Storm, and the Paula Santiago series, most recently, Paula Santiago and the River of Tears, which just came out last month. So thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited to have listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. Audience members, that goes for you as well. I will be in the chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Hi, Lori. Hi. <laughs> How are you? How has your release week been so far? It's been great. It's been a great distraction from the moving that I just talked to you about um, like a couple minutes ago. Um, and it's, yeah, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> release weeks are like always really weird for me because I, I'm like super excited. And then um, it's like you get over like that release day and then it's like, um, like, like a, I can't even find the right word right now. It's, like a crash almost after after a yes. sugar high. Like after you had, you totally had a sugar high and then you crash. <laughs> it really is. It's like book release post Halloween hangover where you like ate too much candy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. No, but it's it's. I mean, people seem super excited, which is like very justified because this book is awesome. I don't have my final copy yet, but even the arc is beautiful. Oh, look at it! It's so beautiful. It's so shiny, like shiny. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love the length. I'm like a big fan of a long middle grade novel. So I'm very, yeah, it's, it's fantastic though. And like, okay, so you're moving. Also, we're in these like bizarrely are unprecedented times. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. like creating and releasing books during all this crazy stuff. Like how, how are you holding up? Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be too honest. I'm like, <laughs> I've been like super like stressed and actually like just my anxiety is like just skyrocketed in like the past month and all that stuff. Um, I ha like, I just moved into this. This is my new house and I just moved here uh, a couple weeks ago. So I've only been here for like a couple weeks, but I had like left my previous house back in the end of July. So I was in, in between place ever since. And so I'm just like absolutely exhausted. You know, I just, I, I want to get settled in. I want to start focusing back on like my work and just the anxiety and like all that stuff and the stress and starting, my son has started at a new school. And oh so everything God. is just and I have a deadline coming up, which is great, you know, so I was like, I just want to be able to focus on my work. Yeah, absolutely. No, I feel you. And like releasing a book while you're under deadline is like enough all by itself, even mm -hmm. without moving a new school and a pandemic and everything else. Um, so, okay, you've had like a long career already of publishing young adult novels, which is something I also do. So I'm always curious, yes. how did you find the transition from young adult to middle grade? Like what was different for you? What do you, what do you like about writing middle grade specifically? Middle grade fiction just really allows me to be, um, to embrace that inner child. Like I have like a really... <laughs> Like I was joking about this the other day. I have a really terrible sense of humor. <laughs> it's like all dad jokes, essentially, right? Yeah, but I and love like, dad jokes. That makes sense. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I can't really like embrace that in my YA, which is a lot, which has a darker um, tilt to it than my middle grade. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so like the middle grade, you know, I really get to embrace the silliness and the um, unlikely scenarios of like <laughs> demons in sundresses you know which happens in Poa oh, and like I just get to you know it's just a lot of fun it's it's like writing writing Pahua was like the most fun I've ever had writing a manuscript because it was just I was it was fun from beginning to ending and like I love writing YA, of course. It's just that, you know, it's just a little a little more serious, a little darker, a little more like intensive, like in terms of um um just the the things that I'm writing about, like whatever issues, little world building, all that stuff. And um, which is not to say middle grade doesn't have that. It's just that it counterbalanced by that, <laughs> you know, silliness and that like uh, joy and that childlike, you know, um lightness. Yes. No, I always say the same thing. Like middle grade is so much fun. And I also write dark angsty YA. So I feel yeah. like the switch to being able to like do funny things and like, you know, it's like, yeah, it can be scary, but also on top of it, you get to do all this. And you are so funny, man. I was like, <laughs> I was <laughs> I'm so glad you think so. Even the first like few chapters, I was like laughing out loud. My partner's like, are you on the phone? And I was like, no, I'm laughing at a book. <laughs> like I'm just like <laughs> cracking up. So funny like the way you portray the spirits are just like it's both amazing to learn about the mythology and also just like yeah really fun like I can tell you were having fun when you wrote it because it's really fun to read <laughs> okay so yeah let's get into Pahua which is I mean just like again beautiful <laughs> hilarious as we've uh, established so what was your favorite part about writing this book besides the dad jokes and how fun it was? <laughs> <laughs> um, the researching part, actually, because, I mean, I can draw from what I know of my culture and my myth, like the, the stories that I've been told as when I was a kid. But I mean, it's not enough, you know, like if I'm yeah. going to create this world um, inspired by, you know, everything that I knew growing up I have to be more immersed in it and like there's going to be there's going to be parts of my own culture that I'm not even familiar with um so I went and I like okay so I live in an area 
in Wisconsin that happens to have a very large Hmong population. And so um, we, I have the benefit of like our li local library having an entire section on like Hmong oh, culture wow. history, which, you know, you won't really find anywhere else. Yeah, um, that is so cool. Yeah, so I checked out like these books that um, someone actually compiled like um, the oral, you know, stories, like the folk tales and um, the the mythology into um, actually written, you know, books or whatever. Um, and they're like extremely old from like the yeah. 80s. <laughs> I can't believe I just said extremely old from the 80s. Like, I can't believe those words just came out of my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm also extremely old from the 80s, so ouch. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> books from the 80s are totally old. I get it. <laughs> like, that was almost, that was like 40 years ago. That's bananas. Okay, sorry, that was a tangent. Um, <laughs> no, but, I get it. <laughs> also but these were, yes. Like the eighties, the seventies, these books were, and like they're out of print. They're like impossible to find now because I tried. I tried like um, um, purchasing them online or like trying to find somewhere where I could get it, and like it was impossible without me wanting to spend like you know eighty dollars on like a ah. twenty-page yeah. book. Yeah, <laughs> I want to do. Yeah. Um, so so I was very fortunate that these books, you know, were at my local library and I could check them out and I was the only person checking them out. So I had them for like literal months yeah. before the, my library was just like, you can't renew them anymore. So I had to return them. <laughs> like, um, return them and go back in like a hat and a mustache. Like, I'd like to check out these books. <laughs> <laughs> I have every intention of checking them out again because I just, I filled them up with like, you know, um, stick it sticky notes and like like all that stuff which I was just like absolutely fascinated by these stories that I had never heard really or like um growing up because I had heard either different versions of these stories or you know I had just heard completely different ones and there's just so many the thing about oral story uh, an oral storytelling tradition is that you know there's just so many versions of the same story or there's just um a lot of stories that you're just never gonna hear because you have to you know find the right people who have heard it so they can retell it to you um so was that, that was just like absolutely fascinating I loved it and I was like reading and I had at this point in time I had a kernel of an idea for Pahua but not like not so much the world yet or not so much even like how she would get from point A to point B yeah. so as I was you know reading these stories these details and these in these folk tales um they sort of fleshed out the world for me which was really cool because I like I read a book or I read a story about like an eagle a stone eagle that has like nine tongues that are Whoa. that can turn that can turn other people into stone and so I was just like well that's gonna go in the book yeah, <laughs> so, amazing and I'm like so yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so just cool. like being able to like pull these details in order in order to like flesh out the story in my head as I was reading, you know, these mythologies. That was very cool. Yeah, that's so cool. And I agree. I had to do the same thing when I was writing for Mexican mythology, like digging in and being like, oh, there's so much I haven't heard because your family does this like very specific version of everything and these stories yeah. are, like these are the few that we tell but there are so many more and so many different versions. And I think it's like it's so cool. And like how do you feel about becoming part of that chain of storytellers. I love thinking about that. Like there have been these old books from the 80s. <laughs> Obviously, you know, like it's an ancient storytelling tradition going back like bajillions of years and now you are like the newest link in it. How does that feel? It's like, at first it was extremely intimidating, you know, cause, yes. <laughs> cause there's that constant worry of like, I don't, I'm not qualified to do this, or like, I don't have right to be doing this, um, simply because I, even though I'm Hmong, and like, you know, where I'm very, like, close-knit with my family, and my family is still very traditional generally, I just, I spent most of my childhood and teen years, like, deliberately distancing myself from my culture, because, you know, I was tired of always being other, and I wanted desperately to fit in, so I, you know, put that, put up that wall between me and my culture. I deliberately never spoke Hmong and I didn't want to do any of like, you know, our traditions and things. I can barely speak my own language now, which really sucks. But, yeah. um, but 
so so you know like with that and me finally you know accepting um my asianness my homeness when i went to college and like as i got older i i still feel very disconnected from my culture because of that so i never had the courage i never had the even I, it never even occurred to me that I could do this <laughs> like because I was just like I don't know enough and I can barely speak Hmong and I only know what you know what I've retained because everything else I've deliberately pushed away so it was a, a mental hurdle to get over and then you know but once I did it's like it, it's sort of one of those things it's just like it's a big deal when you're mired in in that doubt and that self-doubt and all that stuff and then afterward once you get over that it's at least for me <laughs> i'm just like whatever i'm gonna do what i want with my culture yes. <laughs> with my yes. stories yes um yeah like i have to give myself that, that that permission and then once i did i was just like i'm gonna do it and i know there's gonna be people who are, are gonna be unhappy with it especially within you know the fun community and i know i'm gonna get yeah. criticism and I've already gotten, you know, a couple questions and a couple comments wondering, you know, how I'm going to be portraying the Hmong culture and whether it's going to be in a, you know, in an accurate way. I'm just like, yeah. well, it's, it's fantasy, you know, it's yeah. not meant, it's not meant to be super duper accurate. Right. Um, it's very traditional. And, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. um, and I'm just going to play and have fun. And I'm going to, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's, I just want other uh, Hmong kids to be able to read it and to see themselves and be like, that's really cool. And they, so that they won't have that kind of um, experience I did growing up, you know, and being like, never seeing themselves represented and like thinking the solution to that is to cut yourself away from, you know, your own culture. Yeah. And I mean, I relate so much to that. Like I related so much to her character and especially I was like so moved by your author's note where you were describing, you know, what it felt like to kind of choose to distance yourself as a kid from your own culture because it's like so hard to fit in. It's so hard to be both. And then you get into this place where you're like, not enough of this one, you're not enough of this one. And like, where do you really belong? And I think it's like incredible that you're taking that on and saying, you know, I'm going to like write about my culture and I'm going to write about the doubts that I had because I was a kid doing the exact same thing distancing myself from my culture and I think reading a story about a kid who was struggling with you know their family's culture versus the how they want to assimilate into like American life and American school would have been so hugely helpful so I think it's really incredible that you're doing that <laughs> just a fangirl for a second thank you yeah okay I feel like we've been going super heavy so <laughs> I'm like so let's talk about the pandemic and not belonging between cultures and uh who is your favorite character in this book to write and why so it was definitely me which is the cat oh, <laughs> because he's, me. he's oh, so my. fun to write <laughs> <laughs> he he just like you know he's i i, I just like I, and I feel like this is the same for a lot of people, but I just love the sarcastic characters, like, you know, the ones who's always cracking, like, jokes, and who's, like, yes. you know, saying the things that you're thinking, but you probably would not say, actually, actually say out loud. Yes. <laughs> oh, he was my favorite. He's, like, page one, telling her she looks like an eggplant in her shirt, <laughs> dying. It's so cute. And yeah, like added benefit of being invisible so he can come with her to school and <laughs> like yes. make voice cracks about kids who are bullying her and it's amazing. But no, I also always love the snarky side character is my favorite to write too. So we have that in common as well. <laughs> All right. If you could have, if you could have any of the spirits from the book, like as a companion, like you could see them, mm. which one would you pick and why? Tree spirit. I just, I really love trees in general, and it's, like, my, it is a very strange thing to, like, I feel like this is a strange dream to have, but since I was little, I've always wanted an orchard. No, that's <laughs> like amazing. <a> <laughs> that's a great dream. That's, like, one of those things that you want, but are, is, like, so out of the realm of possibility that you just don't even like think about it but I was like recently I recently thought about it like um earlier this year 
I was just like, God, I really want an orchard. And I was reminded of how much I wanted this as a kid. And I'm going to be embarrassing now and say it's because, like, I read a lot of romance novels and they were just like, oh, the orchard. <laughs> they were always romanticized in orchard. Or, like, yeah, romance novels always romanticized orchards. I was just like, yes, yeah, beautiful. Um, but, but yeah, so I always wanted an orchard. And so, like, I just love trees in general. And, like, one of, like, my bucket list items is going to see, like, the, um, the redwoods and, or um, yeah. the, in, is it in California? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so so yes the tree spirits that would be very cool um and plus they're very they're generally very helpful and uh not evil <laughs> so i feel like that's a plus <laughs> trying okay. to find a better word i was trying to find a better descriptor but if you ever make it to like the west coast you have to look me up because i live both an hour and a half from the redwoods and also the migrant farm area in my town is like why my family is here and it's literally just like hundreds of acres of orchards like that's all it is <laughs> it's just like a whole oh valley gosh. full of orchards so if you ever want to go on vacation yes that sounds like heaven to me <laughs> No, the nature spirits were totally my favorite. Like when she was walking with the girls and like the dandelion spirits were following her and like the little mushroom spirits and stuff. I was like, this is the life I want. Why can't I have <laughs> I want tree spirits too. Okay, so what is the spirit from the book that you would be most horrified to run into in real life? If you can do it without spoiling too much. <laughs> Um, are we excluding demons? Yeah. Which are, okay. Pretty, pr I feel like all the demons are <laughs> already pretty <laughs> terrifying. Um, I mean, I guess it would have to be the bridge spirit, right? Because, yeah, she's the one that Pahuak encounters in the second or third chapter. Um, yeah, and the one who she accidentally unleashes from the bridge and which steals her brother's soul into the spirit realm. So she's got some uh, unfinished business, which is probably why she's still hanging around. So, but yeah, any sort of human ghost that with unfinished business kind of creeps you out. So Yeah, I like literally wrote my whole series for Gryden Presents about how terrified I am of human ghosts with business to finish so I deeply relate to that this. Valid. <laughs> Full-blown chills during that whole scene where she first encounters the bridge spirit which is just terrifying in the best possible way. Awesome. <laughs> like you go from like dancing dandelions and they're walking and then you're like no 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 something real awful is about to happen. <laughs> and then it's just, like, just the description was so visceral. I was like oh no this is very very scary. <laughs> okay um from like a writing craft perspective what are your most and least favorite types of scenes to write? <laughs> Um, my most favorite scenes is, like, probably just descriptions <laughs> of, like, settings. I like, I like setting a scene, and I have been told that I'm a little, I go a little too far, and I just, like, start, just, <laughs> yes, I'm, like, describing everything from, like, the sky to the trees to the earth to, like, you know, what you're smelling, what you're hearing. It's like, okay, tone that, tone this down, because we need to actually start moving this scene along. <laughs> So, so relatable. So, yeah. I, our editor, Steph Lurie, is here in the audience, and I think she's probably like I both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I am also a wild over-describer, but okay, so least favorite type of scene to write. Least favorite. Uh, like, it, it used to be, um, I used to love writing fight scenes, but like, now they're just exhausting to write. Yes. <laughs> and like, I love writing, or I love action scenes in general I just I'm just tired of writing them <laughs> yeah yeah every like, single book I write has like a sword fight same no 100% same <laughs> it's always like you have to keep track of the weapon and like where the arm is and I always get the note that's like eh, wasn't she sitting down a minute ago how did she turn her back and then somehow now she's over here <laughs> like I cannot keep track of bodies in space it's so hard <laughs> yeah it's like I enjoy the final product once I get like through it because yeah. I love reading action scenes and being able to like envision it in my head and I'm a very visual writer so I, I think about it in my head and how it would play out and I basically just describe it right um but 
but like just getting through it. And and I also, because I'm an overwriter, um, I write too much of like the body movement. It's like, oh, and then she moved her arm this way, and then she turned this way, and then her leg went this way. I was just like, okay, she, it, just say she kicked. Okay, just like not too many words to describe she kicked. <laughs> This is like my whole revision process is going back <laughs> and being like, did I say 48 words where two words would have been fine? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Currently in the process of editing a 107,000 word book down to like- Oh my gosh. So is I, that the third Paula book? No, no, this is my next YA, but it's just like a big mess right now, but it will get better. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, so let me think. Is there- is there any okay well first of all is there going to be a second book are you working on it do we know we do not know yet we don't know yet okay well we I'm going to go buy this book right now so that we can have a second book because I very much want one are there more stories from your culture that you would like to share that you didn't get a chance to in this book yes um, I already have like some fun ideas for um, either a YA or another middle grade book with, well, not specifically like with Hmong characters, but just inspired by, you know, the Hmong, some Hmong stories and some Hmong folk tales. Um, simply because I, it's like super important for me to include that stuff about my culture in my books, but I also don't want to put myself in a box. Yeah. I don't want to be like every single book I'm going to write is about Hmong culture because I don't I I want to write what I want to write regardless of you know whether it is Hmong or not yeah yeah and that was another part of your author's note that I absolutely loved and that I say all the time which is like <clears throat> don't expect this story to be the only story or like the definitive account because that whole single story narrative of like expecting one marginalized writer to represent their entire culture and everything about it can be so damaging. Yes and like that's really um part of what uh, was really intimidating writing this book as well because as far as I know it, it's the first middle grade book based on Hmong culture that's been published. Like I know there's been chilled like chapter books mm -hmm. um, and like picture books uh, published like uh, with Hmong characters and Hmong culture but I think this might be the first middle grade. Please correct me if I'm wrong with like whoever's listening. But, um, <laughs> like, I couldn't do it. <laughs> But yeah, so it's just like so few people actually know who the Hmong are. Um, and it's the only reason more people know right now is because Suni Lee is Hmong and she just won like, you know, gold at the Olympics. And, and she did. And she's yeah. incredible. <laughs> she's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this book is like, in a way, it is the first and it is like probably, you know, definitive only because it is by itself, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's a little intimidating. So that was something important that I also wanted to put in the author's note, like, please don't read this book and think this is exactly what all Hmong people are like. Cause yeah. Yeah. That's no, so that's scary. <laughs> well, like, congratulations. That's incredible. Like the first one. And it's like, it's so, I mean, I agree that it's so scary to like put yourself out there in terms of writing about your culture, especially when you're, you know, dealing with that kind of disconnect between am I enough? Am I not enough? And like the fact that you did it and it's the first one out there is like incredibly impressive. So <laughs> congratulations. <Thank> definitely. You. <laughs> is there anything about Hmong culture that you wish more people knew? Um, I mean, I feel like it would be great if just people knew who Hmong people were, you yeah. know? Like, my bar is very low. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like, oh. I grew up in Wisconsin, and even here, there's a lot of people who have no idea, you know, who the Hmong are, even though there's a huge, sizable Hmong population. People, a lot of people just don't know, um simply because there's just a lack of interest or, you know, for whatever reason, um, which is fine. It's just, 
it would just be very cool, you know, not to always be like, I'm Hmong. And then I get the response, what is Hmong? Where are you from? Is it Chinese? Is it Japanese? Is it Korean? Like, no, it's none of those things. <laughs> it's none of those things. It's a whole different, there can be other things too. Well, now you can just hand them a copy of your book and be like, start here. And then ask them more <laughs> questions after that. <laughs> And I love being able to point to Suni Lee now, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, here are two things. I can hand you these now. Oh, man. Okay, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to tell readers about this book, this beautiful, hilarious book <laughs> that I'm so excited for people to read and that they should definitely buy from Third Place Books right now? Um, well, it is just about this girl who is trying to figure out where she fits because she's is uh her her family moved to a white majority town and she attends a white majority school and there's you know a little bit of bullying a little bit of ignorance and so she's just trying to figure out um who she is and what she wants to be because she spends a lot of her time pretending to be someone else and so her i guess her character arc her story um like where she hopefully ends up is, you know, figuring out who she is and accepting who she is and, like, understanding that being who she is or being different, standing out, is not a bad thing. And that, you know, if other people have an issue with that, that's a them problem, not a her problem. <laughs> only we all could have learned that lesson <laughs> instead of struggling with it now <laughs> oh yes <laughs> okay so last thing what is next for you what are you working on writing wise um the third book in my YA series which is the shaman born series it's a um high fantasy uh secondary world fantasy um series the third book comes out next year Wow. And so I'm working on that. Kind of. I'm in kind, <laughs> kind of because I'm I just finished like, you know, a, a readable draft that is not like absolutely horrific. And then so right. my editor has it. Thank you. It was like <laughs> huge quite <news>. a trial. <laughs> um Sorry. yeah. And and so I'm anticipating um the revision notes for that any day now. And so I will be working on that. And I'm really, really excited, though, to, like, have a finished trilogy because that'll be yeah. the first for, a first for me. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Man. I'm about to finish my first trilogy, too. And it's, like, it's crazy. I've Ooh, done congrats. all of these before. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, but, yeah, there's something about the third book. Like, I did a duology, and I'm, like, I grew up reading trilogies, though. Like, three books. It just, like, makes, I feel like it makes you feel, like, more legit. You're, like, yeah, no, I'm a real author now. I've done a trilogy. <laughs> have to that's just like the weird thing I think okay I lied one more thing what advice would you give to young writers or people just starting out in writing not necessarily young in age <clears throat> um probably just like don't be afraid to just do whatever you want to write what you want and to, like to not be so caught up in like will anybody like this just so if you like it write it you know um yeah don't be afraid to experiment and find your writing style, find what you like, find what you don't like, just write a lot, read and write a lot, and yeah, have a lot of fun, because when you're young, and you're starting out, like, without all the deadlines and the stress, yes. like, <laughs> really, like, give yourself over to that joy. Yes, that's the best advice, and I'm literally gonna write, don't be afraid to do whatever you want on a post-it note and stick it to my computer, <laughs> because I also need to hear it, and, like, deeply suck in, enjoy writing without deadlines. I feel like it's, like, what, before you have deadlines, all you want is deadlines. Like, I just want someone to, mm -hmm. like, yeah, give me a deadline, tell me it's real, tell me it's gonna come out, and then once you have it, you're like, wait, no, take me back. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to write for fun for a long time. Okay, it looks like we have some audience questions. Would you like to come back out and give us some of those? This has been super fun. Thank you so much for asking me to do this with you. I had a blast. I absolutely love the book. Everyone should read it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Taylor. Thanks for agreeing to do this with me. I've, like, it's been a lot of fun talking with you. And like Taylor and I have known each other like on Twitter and online for quite a number of years. I know. This so, is so, the first time we've yeah. ever done an event together. And it was a blast. And we should do it more. <laughs> yes, I agree.
Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, wait, I saw the thing go on and then it went off again. Yep. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can yes. hear you. Oh, thank goodness. Can you see me? My, my computer is having no. a temper tantrum. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I, I can't type to anybody and my camera won't turn on so oh, no. I'm really glad you can hear me so I'm going to ask some of these questions um Gian wants to know and I apologize if I mispronounced your name um but what books and authors inspired you to write I'm gonna be a cliche because it was our uh, well, first it was R.L. Stein, and then it was Tolkien. Um, R.L. Stein, I started reading very young, probably younger than I should have. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like writing horror when I was in like elementary school and, you know, writing about teens dying gruesomely by ghosts. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and that's probably part of why I write YA because I was reading teen fiction. That's the teen fiction that was available to us at that time. I was reading that from a very early age. Um, so Arl Stein, and then I picked up The Hobbit by Tolkien, and it was just mm, like life changing. <laughs> like to be not to like be overly dramatic, but no. reading The Hobbit <laughs> as a kid, you know, was like wow, this is a, this is the type of story that I want to write. I want to write a a world that sweeps you off your feet, that sweeps you off in an adventure, one that you want to return to again and again. So what about you? Oh man, I think, I mean, I, yeah, I also read the R.L. Stein books way, way too early and other like scary things <laughs> and scary stuff. And then like, again, I, I loved the Tolkien books too. I think I read The Hobbit. I was grounded and all I was allowed to <laughs> read. And so I read the whole Hobbit before I got ungrounded and was like, all right, I need the rest of these. Um, the His Dark Materials series by Philip Pullman oh. was like, huge for me. Yes. When I wanted to get into writing children's literature, I like remembered that and was like that those books were so sweeping and complicated and morally gray and just beautiful. So I like absolutely love those. But also I think I was like inspired by a lack of books that felt like home to me more than I was by any particular book. So I was just like, man, if I can't find this, I need to make it myself. <laughs> That's a great way to think, especially if you were a young writer, because I feel like a lot of young kids, at least for me, like I was the type of young kid who didn't know that I could fill that gap. Yeah. I thought I had to just write what was, write like what was available if I wanted to be a writer. So like, you know, that's why I thought I had to write about, you know, kids who didn't look like me, characters who didn't look like me. So it's it's in a, it's definitely a step ahead <laughs> that you were yeah. able to like you know see that and want to be the writer who filled that gap versus you know um what I did <laughs> yeah no I definitely didn't think about filling the gap until I was like way older and like had a kid of my own at the time I did the same thing as you I was like okay let's write books that seem like all the other books which like I guess is good practice but I hope kids like now see more representation and are able to like know that they can write about themselves earlier because you're right that's such an alienating experience sorry we're rambling <laughs> no I love it <laughs> So we have a few more questions. Um, I love this one. So this question says, how do you write? Do you have a specific method? Um, do you do a lot of research? So I think this is just a general process question. Um, I don't know about you, but I am a plotter, not a pantser. Um, so I outline quite a bit. Like my outlines usually get around 25 plus pages and I've gotten up to like 50 page plus outlines <laughs> and I like that you're nodding because I yeah. don't see that too often <laughs> no totally I, yeah usually I'm the one that people are like are you serious that's crazy but no I do the same thing yeah like very long outlines that are like bizarrely detailed and then mm -hmm. 
sometimes I like completely go off the rails. I don't know if you do this. Like I get halfway through it and I'm like, no, this is all wrong. <laughs> I have to like redo the whole thing, but yeah. yeah no, but I feel like that's one of the benefits of having an outline because I would rather have like 25 pages of an outline and realize there's a huge plot hole and I need to change everything versus having, you know, 150 pages and I'm halfway through, I'm just like, oh no, this is not working. Yeah, this so. is exactly what I always say. Like, I would much, much rather have. Like, it takes like a few days to get to the point where you're like, ooh, that's not going to work. We're going to have to go back and change something. And then you go back and change one sentence instead of scrapping like whole chapters of the book. Yeah, no. Every time someone's like, I don't know, I just open up the computer and start typing. I'm like, it gives me hives. <laughs> I'm like, I'm impressed by people who can do it. And obviously there's like every different way to write, but I cannot imagine writing a book without a plan. <laughs> I tried like my very first NaNoWriMo I tried I had like a general idea of what I wanted to do and then yeah. like I started writing and like the pressure to write every day meant and like without an outline meant I was just like spewing out words and things were happening and I was like plot lines were getting dropped and and then I couldn't figure out how to resolve something so I just continue continue writing as if it had already been <laughs> resolved and like telling myself I'll just come back and fix it later um and then of course I didn't um, but, but yeah, at the end, I was just like, so burnt out. And I was like, this is the worst book in the world. And, um, it took me six months to get back into that book and like even have the desire to like rewrite and fix it. So I couldn't, I, yeah, pantsing's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> not for me. Yeah. Nope. I feel you. I can't, yeah, I can't imagine. I've never even tried it though. So that's, <laughs> that's you tried it. I've never even tried it. Like, nope, nope, nope. I've tried to write a shorter outline before. <laughs> like, okay. Like I'll have to write a synopsis for a pitch or something. And my agent will be like, please, please, three to five pages, just five pages. And I turn in like 27. I'm like, sorry, but that's how many pages it took to explain what was going to happen. Not a great. I try to like, I try to have two different documents, one for my agent, which is actually, you know, just uh, a couple page synopsis and then like, you know, a, a short breakdown. And then the one that I actually look at, which is like <laughs> 20 pages. <laughs> Thank you both so, for that fun insight. <laughs> So let's see. This is a great question, which I also was going to ask. Um, are there any books or authors that you would like to put a spotlight on or that you would like to scream about that you're really excited about, either new or old? So many. There's so many. I always like, I'm like, I know there's so many good ones and I'm going to forget people, but Nina Moreno, please everyone read everything Nina Moreno's ever written. Um, Clara Bell Ortega has a new middle grade coming out yes. called Witchlings, and I am like beyond hyped for that. Um, and then, I mean, I feel like this is like the lazy answer, but we have like a built in, like, stable of incredible authors that Rick Riordan presents. So if you liked either of our books, please read all the rest of them because they are all solid gold, like, not a bad one in the bunch. Yes, agreed. I'm also Truly. super duper excited for um, what I believe is called Tide Song, which is a graphic novel by Wendy <laughs> Shu. Yes. Yes. It like her art is just so whimsical and um, enchanting is the word that comes to mind. I just I love her style so much. Her stories are so um, so fun and yes. I keep thinking just the word whimsical. It's, it's like her work is just gorgeous and I'm super excited for that. I'm deeply obsessed with Wendy Zhu. She's like one of my, my daughter. So I had a copy of Mooncakes in my house forever, just like in my vast and sprawling TBR that I'm never going to get to. And my daughter is eight and she came in and was like, this looks cool. Can I try this one? And I was like, sure. And she became like a one child Wendy Zhu. <laughs> like she's obsessed with Mooncakes. She can, like, she's read it like seven times. She's drawn like fan art of the character oh, and like, made her I own. I love that. Art. It's based on it and I like sent them to Wendy on Twitter and she was like so encouraging and kind so yeah Tide Song we're very excited I think we pre-ordered the hardcover and the paperback because they're both <laughs> so good those are such good answers I I'm so sorry everyone 
I usually I would be linking to these books, but I've got a frozen screen here. So we're just going to oh, no. roll right along. So hopefully I don't see, I don't see any other questions. That could be because my screen is frozen. <laughs> I don't see any either, if that helps. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, yeah. so that sounds good. If anybody has any questions, now is kind of your last chance. Go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. We would so love to hear from you. Um, I am going to ask just a really quick question. Um, if not, so you both have written both for YA and for middle grade. Uh, if not these two genres, which, where would you go if you were given just infinite freedom to pursue anything? Mm. I'm the type of person where you give me an open choice. I'm just like, I freeze. <laughs> I need to, like, <laughs> it has to be multiple choice for me to pick something from. <clears throat> from the list of all genres that exist. Um, okay, I would, I've, I've always wanted to write, like, an adult multi-POV, like, sprawling fantasy, so, like, a big epic fantasy, so maybe someday that, but, like, a thing that I've always wanted to do and probably would be awful at and therefore think about constantly is just, like, a rom-com, like, a classic rom-com, because I love to read them, but I just, everything I write is angsty and speculative, and I, and I just <laughs> don't know if I could do it, but maybe someday I will try, because I love them so much when other people write them. Okay, we're like the same person because my answers <laughs> are like the same. Um, yeah, great. yeah, like I want to write the uh, multiple point of view epic fantasy, like adult epic fantasy. Um, it's just a challenge that I want to like give myself someday. I'm terrible at writing multiple point of view. Like I've tried it in the past and they just all sound the same. You know, like, the voice just ends up all sounding the same. So I can't quite do it yet. But that is a skill that I am working towards. Um, and then, like like you said, rom-coms, because I used to write, read a lot of romance, but I'm like, for some, for whatever reason, I'm just kind of stuck at writing uh, romance, like, unless it's like fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody else's sandbox, like I will go in there all yes. day. <laughs> yeah, I love writing like the romance in, in fan fiction, but in my own works, I don't know what it is. I just kind of stall when it comes to romance. Um, so I would really love to write uh, a romantic um, comedy, maybe a rom-com, or maybe just straight romance. Like when I was little, I also wrote uh, some historical romance, because I read a lot of like Regency romance. Yes. Um, and so I, I wrote some of that, and then it obviously did not pan out. But um, it was awesome, though. <laughs> it was highly inappropriate as well. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so romance, even like historical, anything historical, actually, I would love to write something historical. Um, it's just like the level of research required for like historical, like intimidates me. Yeah. I, I love history and actually becoming a historian was one of the, uh, like my other career options. Um, but, but yeah, history is, so fascinating and interesting but being able to write a historical novel and throwing characters into actual history that is like super intimidating to me yeah it's <laughs> very scary I agree because it's like everything we were talking about about being like qualified to write from your own culture's perspective but then on top of that you're writing about stuff that someone could fact check like the best mm -hmm. thing. Like, <laughs> yes. no one's gonna fact check my ghost story and even if they did it'd be like what that's how I heard it but like yeah you're writing about actual history like definitely someone's gonna be like mm, that actually happened in 1744 so you must <laughs> right <laughs> those are really good answers I would be completely on board for any of those books. So <laughs> you keep us posted. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, was there a moment that either of you or both of you remember where you really learned that language has a lot of power? Um, was there like a moment that made you think, okay, this, I have to do this, I have to write? 
I know I'm totally putting you on the spot. So if- <laughs> like, please pause while I go through my entire personal history. <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. Right? <laughs> my brain is buffering. <laughs> It'll be a bit- <laughs> I don't think there was a single moment. Um, I mean, I love being able to like disappear into these um, worlds from these these books that I was reading. But I wanted to be, I was the type of person who wanted to be the one creating the worlds as well. Um, I wanted, I wanted to have some of that magic myself because it felt like magic being able to do that. Um, And then I, I guess, I think back to, I think it was fourth grade when I had this um, substitute teacher. Her name was Mrs. White. And she was there the entire length of the year because my actual teacher was out. Um, She had cancer. So she was, you know, um, uh, getting treatments and stuff. So we had a substitute teacher that entire year. And she was the absolutely most encouraging, like, teacher that I've ever had, like, in elementary school I should say <laughs> like specifically in elementary school who who just absolutely loved my stories that I would write and she would encourage them and she would tell me how good I was and how, like you know she I guess she gave me like the confidence to um believe that actually what I was doing was something I wanted to do and something that um what might actually be good I feel like there need to be more good stories about substitute teachers because I, (laughs) as soon as you said like a substitute teacher, I was like, oh no, this story is going to be awful. Like, I feel like everyone has this story about a bad substitute teacher. I need to like hear more heartwarming (laughs) substitute teacher stories because that was beautiful. (laughs) I don't know if I have a single moment either. Most of mine are probably just like fear based. Like I would hear a story, like the story of La Llorona, which first Paulo Santiago book is based on is like a terrifying story about like a woman who drowns her children and then drowns herself and spends the rest of eternity haunting riverbanks looking for more children to drown so I think probably when I realized that like I was up all night like terrified of like things that were just words that someone said to me like I didn't see a ghost (laughs) like nothing happened except that I heard someone talk about it or read about it so I think when I realized that stories could scare people probably I also realized that they could make them feel other things but like fear was definitely the gateway (laughs) yes Al Stein (laughs) yeah Yeah, I like the um (laughs) those scary stories to tell in the dark I love them they were terrifying to me but I loved them Kids Mm -hmm. still love those books, too. Like, the scary stories to tell in the dark. Like, I was, like, waffling right before I finished writing Paolo Santiago, the first book, and my friend, who's an elementary school librarian, was like, I was like, is this too scary for sixth graders? (laughs) Like, am I doing a bad thing? And she was like, no, those are the books that are still the most checked out in the library, is, like, those old, corny stories to tell in the dark from when we were in elementary school. Okay, but the illustrations in those very early novel or early versions of the scary stories, those were downright terrifying. Like, legit terrifying. So scary. Do you remember the one about the girl with the ribbon around her neck? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, and her head. <laughs> oh my god, no, I'll I'm never do it. <laughs> it will never stop. Like, me. I checked out those books all the time, but when I put it on my table, it had to be face down. Face I didn't down. even want to look at, like, the cover. They're terrifying. <laughs> 100% agree. <laughs> really those are that's really really good answer because me too (laughs) (laughs) me too so we are just about at the end of our time together tonight um at the end of events I'd love to ask what is on the horizon for each of you um I know we've sort of answered that question but is there anything that you want to yell about here right at the end leave us with a a note (laughs) Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. um yeah um aside from the third book in my YA series I'm also working on you know other stuff that I can't talk about unfortunately secrets. Um, yes. Secrets. yes good secrets that is the nature of publishing constantly <laughs> so many secrets I want to like shout about but I can't <laughs> um but yeah please just keep reading and keep buying books and keep supporting even though it's really hard right now 
Um, I have, yeah, Paula Santiago and the Forest of Nightmares is my second book in the series, and it just came out um, last month. <laughs> I'm like, what is time? When did it come out? I don't remember. <laughs> and then the third one is called Paula Santiago and the Sanctuary of Shadows, and it'll be out next summer. So nothing, like, immediate on the horizon, but definitely there are two power books to catch up on <laughs> before the third one. Oh. <laughs> So exciting. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for being here. Audience members, thank you all for being here. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad that I got to uh, be a fly on the wall in here. Um, audience members, go ahead and follow those links in the chat. Go get your hands on a book. We would so love to see you in the bookstore or, you know, if you're not local, you can, of course, shout at us on the internet. We always, always, always love to hear from you. And I think from here, I'm going to say one more huge, huge thank you to our authors. Thank you so much. And I think now is the time for some awkward waving. Yes. <laughs> so Thank you so there much. Are you. Congratulations, Lori. Yes. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you for doing this with me. Yes. Of okay. Course. So great okay. to finally talk with you. Yes. It was so much fun. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Okay. So I'm trying to push the end button, but I'm completely frozen. So <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I, now we're, we're just going to keep waving for the next hour. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> awkward of the awkward waving nights. <laughs> so everyone can go ahead and just end the call for themselves, and I will work this out the best I can. Right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, come on. This computer. Oh, oh.